and uh, just going to read two verses. And this morning's sermon is going to be a little bit different. It's more like a teaching sermon, if you will. Um, kind of a doctrinal, you could say it's deep, it may not be deep. I don't know how it will all come about, how it will make sense to you. But just going to preach on uh, verse 43 and verse 44, but in particular verse 43. All right, John 4, 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit we've heard uh, already from you. Uh, Lord, in the song service, Lord, in the uh, amens or the praise of the Lord, or the raising of the hands, or Lord, perhaps just in the songs, Lord, the way they're sung from the heart. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, you laying that song, Trust and Obey, on uh, Miss Carol's heart. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, thank you for the uh, giving portion of the service, but God, as we uh, try to uh, round second going into third, Lord, to get home, God, I pray you help uh, drive home the point of this message. Help us, Father, to look forward, not um, uh, just to the things happening today and in our world today, but, Lord, look forward to the things that will be happening in the future, but also, Lord, be thankful that we have a future ahead of us because of what you did for us in the past. And I pray, God, you'd uh, make this sermon make sense in our hearts. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to have an understanding of what is being preached. Lord, give us the sense of the scriptures, I pray. We thank you for every word in the Bible. We're thankful, Lord, for every doctrine in the Bible, every truth in the Bible. Uh, Lord, without it, we'd be just on sinking sand, just kind of floating on the midst of a big, giant river with a destination nowhere. So I pray, God, you'd get us uh, to the place you'd have us get to today. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. you. may be seated. I want to preach on those two words, or those three words, after two days. After two days. Uh, that phrase there, after two days, is found four times in your King James Bible. I like to look up phrases. I like to look up words. Uh, I like to look it up how many times a word is used, the context, the meaning, the definition uh, of words, and, and how it all uh, fits uh, practically, spiritually, prophetically, if at all. Now, practically, in the text here, uh, all you're getting is a timeline. Uh, all you've gotten up until now is a timeline. So he says, after two days, which is the two days that he stayed there in, uh, in Samaria, verse 40, after those two days, he begins to head on into Galilee. So either the writer John is giving us more information than God wanted us to have, Either the writer John is just filling, uh, like most pastors do, filling in time and space uh, with excess of words to, uh, you know, to get the point across, or God had a, a reason for telling John to make sure you include in the Bible how many days I was there in Samaria. And so John writes, after two days, he departed and went uh, into Galilee. Uh, I think this phrase has important applications to doctrine, uh, to historical doctrine in the past, to historical doctrine in the present, and historical doctrine in the future. I think there's a timeline here. I do believe in timelines. I was working on one this morning when I came in. I like timelines. I like putting things on a chart, on a timeline, to kind of help me put things into perspective and kind of help things uh, lay, be laid out decently. And in order. Now, I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of yes, God. Amen. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, first and foremost, then, uh, then for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 18. And so I want to preach you this morning a doctrinal message on the, that phrase there, after two days, Okay. All right, so let's go over to Matthew 26. Hold your finger in John. Let's go over to Matthew 26. Hopefully by the time we get to the end, you'll appreciate the phrase, but maybe God will do something in your heart that goes beyond just what we're looking at this morning. Perhaps there's something here intended for you this morning that God wants you to get a hold of uh, to get closer to Him. Just maybe, just maybe you're in church for a reason this morning. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right, Matthew 26, verse 2. Actually, you can read verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, now here's that phrase, ye know that after two days 
is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Uh, if you're keeping uh, notes there in your bulletin, that first blank there is the feast of Passover, the feast of Passover. And so he says, after two days is the feast of Passover. Look at Mark chapter 14. That phrase is found four times. Twice it's in reference to the Passover and the crucifixion of Christ. Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 1. Every gospel account builds upon, adds information uh, as to what's going on. Some stories are told all four times. Other times is limited to just once or twice. But here, it, uh, this phrase is used twice in Matthew and Mark. Mark 14, 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover. Now, Mark adds an additional note here. He says, and of unleavened bread. Uh, the Passover was the 14th day, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, was the 15th day. It ran seven days. It ran the 14th to the 21st. So the Passover was the 14th. That's when it started. When that day was over, then the 15th was what was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that ran the next six days up until the 21st of the first month, which was Nisan or Abib. Uh, now he says, after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. So obviously speaking of uh, his crucifixion. Then they said, uh, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So these really good religious Jewish priests... So we can kill Jesus, but just not on the Passover. <laughs> we can kill the Messiah. We can kill this guy that's healing people and is raising the dead. Uh, we can kill this man that says, uh, I'm not coming to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Uh, we can kill this man that says, for God so loved the world. Uh, we can uh, we can, uh, we can, can kill this man that uh, it gives sight to the blind and that uh, gives uh, hearing to the deaf and that gives uh, hope to the future. We can kill him, but just not on uh, on Sunday, not on the feast day, if you will, not on Passover Sunday or Saturday or Thursday or whatever day it fell on, because it's the 14th that changed every day of the week, and uh, not on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We can't do it then. Uh, let's do it uh, when it's more convenient. And so he says, after two days would be the Passover. So God uh, had to have his son uh, killed before Passover. And the only day that fits is the Feast of the Preparation Day. Or the, not the Feast of Preparation Day, but the Preparation Day. That's the day that he had to be killed on. And uh, go to John. We'll see that in the book of John. Go back over to John. John chapter 18. 19, sorry. John 19. They say we can't kill him on the Passover we can't kill him during the feast, so we got to kill him on the day before, the preparation day. Look at John 19, verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, that's the sixth hour of the day, high noon time. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Paul, Paul, Pilate saith unto him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So just as he prophesied that after two days they were going to kill him, or he'd be killed, uh, crucified. They crucified Jesus Christ on the preparation day, the day before uh, the Passover. All right, so let me give it to you like this. Jesus ate with his disciples on the 12th day of the month. He was arrested at even 6 p.m. on the 13th day. If you look over here on, your, on, your, on my timeline, here you have uh, a thing where the Jewish time starts at 6 p.m. The Jewish new day started at 6 p.m. So there's 6 p.m. would be our 12 a.m., okay? Remember the Bible says evening in the morning was the first day. So when God marked the day in the Jewish timeline, it started at 6 p.m. and it ran until 6 p.m. the next day. 
So around 6 p.m., uh, Jesus Christ leaves his disciples there in the upper room and goes out into a garden. Uh, sometime between 6 p.m. and uh, 12 p.m., I'm uh, sorry, sometime between 6 p.m. and 3 a.m., Jesus Christ is uh, betrayed by uh, uh, Judas and uh, Peter denies him. Remember, uh, the Bible says that uh, you'll deny me uh, you won't deny me, uh, or the cock won't crow twice until you deny me, Peter. So around 3 a.m., which is the cock crowing hour, between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Peter denies the Lord. Or 6 p.m. to 3 a.m., somewhere between all of that, Jesus Christ has been eating supper with his disciples, has gone out into the garden and prayed. Uh, remember, they were sleeping on the job, or they're supposed to be praying for him. And he says, what, could you not watch the meat one hour? And he goes back and says the same thing praying three times. So there's at least three hours where Jesus is in the garden praying. And then at some point, we don't know the gap, but at some point, uh, Judas shows up with, you know, pitchforks and, and torches and betrays him. And uh, and then they go into the palace and that's where Peter denies the Lord. There's a, there's a time uh, gap there between 6 p.m. and 3 a.m. That's when everything happened uh, to the Lord. And uh, then they have his trial, his mock trial, from uh, 3 a.m. Uh, till uh, 12 p.m., high noon, and that's when they put Christ on the cross. So all that stuff is going on there. But, uh, but that's why, but that's, their, that's the time of the new day for them. So on the 13th, so he's, he's eating with his disciples on the 12th. He's uh, betrayed, and he's put on the cross on the, uh, on the 13th. Put here the 13th. Now, that kind of makes sense if you think about Galatians uh, 3.13, right? You've got to read Galatians 3.13 sometime. Uh, 13 is the number of rebellion. 13 is the number that's associated with the Antichrist. Judas betrays Jesus Christ on the 13th. John 3.13, Jesus Christ has been made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everything that hangeth on a tree. So Jesus Christ is hanging on a tree, cursed on the 13th day, the day before the 14th, which would begin at 6 p.m., that would start your Passover um, uh, uh, week, if you will. Thus, after two days from the Lord's Supper, Jesus was in the heart of the earth as both the sin offering lamb that was slain to take away our sin and the Passover lamb that was slain so that the wrath of God would pass over all believers. So, sorry, Brother Jim. Um, so, here on this really poor timeline that I'm working on, um, here is where Christ is on the cross. And, uh, and that's, on, that's on the 13th. Now, I remember they said, you know, we can't be up there on the cross on the Passover day. We've got to get him off. So he was in the tomb. He had to be in the tomb before 6 p.m. on Passover day, okay? Because that's the next day. And that, they said he can't be on the cross on the Passover. we got to get him off and in the ground. Um, and so, so Christ is on the cross from 12 p.m. <coughs> Till before, till up until 6 p.m. at the very latest, but they had to get him off, off the cross and in the tomb. So somewhere between probably 4 and 6 p.m., he's off the cross and he's in the tomb before the new day, 6 p.m. started. And uh, and part of that time, he's already remember this trial went from 3 a.m. till when he's hanging on the cross. That was no picnic. Right. Long before he got on the cross, what were they doing? Beating, Beating him. Ripping out his beard, uh, spitting on him, uh, whipping him with a cat of nine tails, just ripping the flesh off. That Bible says his visage, his face, his feature, his appearance was marred more than any other man. Remember during this time, he's not only with Pilate, but he's also sent over uh, to Herod, I think it was. And so a lot of stuff is going on in the life of Christ between the time of his arrest and the time where he's put uh, in the tomb. And it's kind of interesting because... The life of Christ's ministry from the time of his baptism, which is his anointing, that's when he was anointed, was his baptism, from the time of his anointing to the time of his death was three and a half years. Wow. If you think about how much time Christ was betrayed, hung on the cross before he was put in the tomb, it was about three and a half, uh, it was about three and, uh, um, uh, uh, three and a half days. Because if you think about it this way, he was in the tomb of the heart of the earth for three days, isn't that right? Well, half the day he's being whipped, beaten, and scourged, and crucified. So three and a half days of Christ suffering the sin for mankind. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Matching his earthly ministry, which is three and a half years. Three and a half days between his time in the heart of the earth in hell and half the day spent on hell on earth, in hell on earth, if you will. 
if you will. All that kind of stuff matches there. Why? For you. Amen. For me. Yeah. That Bible says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, I usually think of Christ as only the Passover Lamb, because 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is called our Passover. Yes, amen. But do you know that nothing that had to happen on the Passover day, there had to be a daily sin offering? Mm -hmm. The Passover Lamb was only a memorial. The initial one was so that way they were covered by the blood. Mm -hmm. Everything after that was a memorial of all that. Yeah. Well, Jesus Christ is our Passover and that his yes. blood covers my sin. Yes. But he was also, but the Passover lamb was not shed to take away sin. You know that? Amen. The Passover lamb every year on the 14th day was not shed to take away the sin right. of the Jews. Right. Any more than the Passover lamb on the day they left Egypt was she to take away sin? Mm -hmm. It was a blood covering. Right. God instituted sacrifices for sins under the Mosaic law. Yeah. And there was a daily sin offering. So that is on the day of on the day of Christ, on the day of Christ's crucifixion, there was at least two lambs killed. One lamb was the Passover lamb. We got that. But that don't take away my sin. But one lamb did. Amen. One lamb was the sin offering. That's the one that took away, takes away my sin. This one just says I'm covered by the blood. Just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he shed this one to give me eternal security. Amen. He shed this one to take away all my sin. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. I'm thankful that he, both lambs were killed on that day. Yeah. He says, behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The Passover lamb was not the lamb that took away the sin of the world. The sin offering lamb was. The Passover lamb is the thing that you look at and say, thank God my sins are forgiven. Thank God I'm still covered by the blood, but I'm covered by the blood because he forgave me all my trespasses. He forgave me all my sin. Amen. Amen. So after two days, there Jesus Christ is in the heart of the earth for three days, suffering the torments of hell. You know what that Bible says in Isaiah 53? It says he made his soul an offering for sin. Yeah. Now, you know what you do with the lamb, whether it be the burnt offering lamb, the sin offering lamb, or the Passover lamb? You know what you do with it? You burn it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. So Jesus Christ, as both the sin offering lamb wow. and the Passover lamb, was down in the heart of the earth for three days suffering the torments of hell. Now, how can God suffer all the torments? Don't you have to suffer for hell for all eternity? Yeah, but he's an eternal God. Amen. Amen. In other words, God didn't have to be there for all of eternity to suffer the torments of hell for all of eternity. His soul had to go and get touched with the flames of hell, and he would feel that for all of eternity. That's what covers me from going down there. I don't have to go there because an eternal God, First Timothy tells us, our an eternal God went down there and took the eternal torments of hell upon himself. See? So I'm covered either way you look at it. Amen. As the Passover lamb and as the sin offering lamb. After two days. Amen. All right, now I'll go over to, um, well, I'll go back over to John. Go back over to John. After two days, Jesus Christ is in the heart of the earth as both the sin offering and the Passover lamb. But what's that got to do with me today? Well, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. Yeah, yeah. But look down at uh, verse 45. Uh, remember he says, after two days he goes into Galilee, verse 45. Then, when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem, look at, at the feast. So we've just seen one feast. It's called the Feast of the Passover. But there's another feast mentioned that has to do with something I'm looking forward to. Look over in John chapter 2. What feast was he at in Galilee? John chapter number 2. This will be your second point there in your bulletin. Look at John chapter 2, verse 1. How about watch the, watch the connections here. And the third day. Now, we're going back in time. I understand that. But after two days is the third day. Is that right? You don't get to the third day unless you got two days. 
So he's after two days, he was in Galilee, then he's going down. After two days, he was in Samaria, then he's going down on the third day back to Galilee. Is that right? Yeah. Isn't it? Watch this now. Okay. After two days, he goes down into Galilee. So on the third day, he's going down into Galilee. Yeah. Well, the first time he showed up in Galilee, look what day it was. It was the third day. What's going on on the third day? There's a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And, bo and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Your second point is called the Feast of Marriage. The Feast of Marriage. Now, guess what, church? The church age lasts for two days. Say, wait a second. Two days? We've, we've had more than two days of church history. Well, yeah, 2 Peter tells us that a day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. So spiritually speaking, prophetically speaking, after 2,000 years of the church age, guess where we're going on the third day? To a wedding. We're going to a wedding. Amen. We're going to a, a, a feast of marriage, <coughs> a marriage feast. See, after two days of spending time around here in this world... Amongst all the Gentiles, amongst all the unsaved, amongst all the ungodly, amongst all the present evil that is found in this world, after two days, we're going to a marriage feast. Amen. After two days of putting up with all the, the junk and all the hysteria and all the, the crooks and the criminals and all the powers that be, after two days, we are going to a marriage feast. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. Amen. After two days... He was crucified, and he was in hell, and he suffered the torments of hell, but he ain't stay there. No, amen. He rose again. Yeah. He ascended, and he went up to sit next to the Heavenly Father there where he ever lived to make intercession for us. But one day, one day very soon, according to the prophetical time clock, the timeline only goes just so far. One day very soon, the second day is coming to an end, and we're going to go into the third day, yeah. and the third day kicks off called the Day of Christ. Amen. And the Day of Christ is where you have the judgment seat of Christ, where we are judged not for our sins, because that was judged at Calvary, yeah. but we are judged for our works here on earth. Yeah. And when we leave that judgment seat of Christ, when God purifies all things and makes all things right and, and just so, we go off into a marriage feast. Amen. Now, this feast don't take place here on earth. No. Right. Uh, there's some teaching, some thought that maybe uh, when the Jews get their land back in the millennium, then we will celebrate. No, no, no. Uh, we will be at a marriage feast in heaven uh, while the, here on earth they're going through a time called uh, a tribulation or the great tribulation or the time of the end, or Daniel's 70th week, or time of Jacob's trouble. All that's going on down here while we are in heaven at a feast, Amen. the feast of marriage. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, you know what I saw talking about this with another brother this week? Look at uh, verse number six. There's six water pots of stone. That represents 6,000 years of human history. 6,000 years of human history. Nothing but a bunch of water pots. <laughs> a bunch of stone water pots. And it says, After there was set six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now that's not Jesus, but he's a good type of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, that which is work, thou, that, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. You know one reason why I'm a dispensationalist? Because God didn't give the good wine to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. God didn't give the good wine to Moses. God didn't give the good wine to Adam. God didn't give the good wine to Noah. God gave the good wine, the new wine, the blessed wine that flowed from the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God says, I'm going to give you that good wine. I'm going to give you of uh, that wine that flows for eternal uh, uh, refuge and safety and grace and mercy. I'm thanking God that I got in on the good wine. Amen. I'm not, I wasn't under the law. I didn't get saved by uh, works. I got saved by grace through faith. That's the good wine. Yeah. But you know what I was thinking about? 
Where did that water come from? It wasn't holy water, folks. I don't know what the water filtration system was back in those days, but I can't imagine it was your Zephyr Hills or your Poland Springs or your smart water. <laughs> It was just regular old water from the wells of Galilee. And Galilee wasn't known as a very clean place. You know what you and I are? We're a bunch of dirty water pots with a yeah. bunch of dirty water Amen. in it. Yep. And it's not until the, the, the voice of God, the touch of God, the heart of God came in contact with you that he took you from being just a, a, a water pot filled with dirty water and he made all things new. Amen. That's why I'm going to a feast. Yeah. Amen. You know what the Bible says? He says, I'll not drink it. I'll not drink that wine until I drink it new with you yeah, in amen. my father's kingdom. I, I got a good uh, a touch, a good taste of that good wine, but only in spiritual sense. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I, I can only imagine. She always get nervous when you're taking this coat off. <laughs> I can I, right now I can I can only just picture in my I only have a in essence, I only have an idea, a glimpse of what that, that wine tastes like in a very spiritual sense. Because every once in a while, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the, the love of God gets flowing down inside of me. It's like you can almost get there. But can I say one day, it's going far beyond just sort of the ideal yeah. or the thought of yeah. or the glimpse of. You know, one day we're going and we're going to sit down Amen. and we're actually going to have... The cup in our hand, yeah. and we're gonna have the wine in our hand, yeah. and whatever that wine is, ain't no man drank of it before. He calls it new wine, and we're gonna taste what it is to taste God Amen. in person. Amen. We're gonna get the fullest essence, the fullest nature, the divinest of all things. We're gonna taste it with our own taste buds. A purified, holy taste bud is gonna taste a holy, purified God in a way no man has ever been able to. It ain't like the wafer or cracker thing they got at the, at the Catholic Mass. No, that ain't nothing like it at all. Amen. But they're trying to project that. Yeah. Well, I already tasted of it spiritually speaking, but I'm looking forward to sitting down with Jesus Amen. and eating. Whatever he makes and whatever he puts in the cup, Amen. I can't even, uh, you can't get your mind around it having pure and holy taste buds. Amen. But I'm looking forward to that day. When's it going to take place? After two days. Do you know, folks, how close we are to this thing being over? Yeah. We are on the precipice. Now, I'm not dating the rapture. Don't get freaked out, Brother Tom. There <laughs> you go again, dating the rapture. <laughs> but, folks, I'm telling you, we are close. Yeah. If he says it's two days and two days is 2,000 years, you got to start dating that from somewhere. Mm -hmm. I date it with the cross right. because the church began at Calvary. Yeah. Um, and so that's when the New Testament, the New Testament is in my blood. So the New Testament began at Calvary. Right. All right. And so if he died between the, the, the dates defer, he's, he died between being 33 and 37 years old. 2,000 years from that is either 2,033 or 2,037. But does that mark when he comes back at the second advent? Does that mark when he comes back for the rapture? Okay, up for debate. Let's just say it marks when he comes back for the rapture of the church. It's 2,033 to 2,037. Folks, we are in 2,023, which means we have about 10 to 14 more years to go. That ain't a lot of time. Man, that's too long, I know it could be any day now. Come on. Because that's the other thing, brother, is you don't know how that thing works out. All I'm saying is, folks, we are close. Yeah. I don't care how far the calendar is off. We are close. Amen. We are very close. You're right, brother. It could be any day now. I understand all that. All I'm saying is it can't go much farther beyond all that. Yeah. I'm yeah. I wrote 2023 on the board. All I'm saying is if all I'm saying is if the tribulation is 10 years long and that that 2,000 years includes the tribulation period, then that's 2033. It could be this year. Amen. It could be today. Amen. It could be right now. Amen. Don't blink, you might miss it. 
So what we have, what we have is a feast of marriage that we're looking forward to. Uh, the Bible calls this thing here, the Bible calls the, the, uh, the day that we go up to heaven, he calls it the day of Christ. I don't have time to teach the rest of that thing there, but if you take Christ's life and you take it according to the, the watches of the night, and you take that timeline and match it to the life of Christ, the reason why it's called the day of Christ is because I believe that the, the time of Christ's death was the cock, cock crowing. That's the last hours before the morning watch. In other words, we ought to be watching for the Lord to come. That's the day of Christ. And then once we are gone, the next thing to happen is called the day of the Lord. But the next thing to happen is called the day of Christ. And it's called our blessed hope in Titus chapter 2, Amen. verse 13. Uh, we call it the rapture. Well, the rapture is not a, a King James Bible word. Uh, no, but I can give you some words that are, that are very close to it. Yeah. Took. Yeah. Took is very close. Yeah. Uh, the word rapture comes from rupture. Also, it violently, it's, it's a violent taking away, rape, rapture, rupture, and a take. It's all come from that same idea there where God is going to take us by force out of this world. Amen. Now, I'm not a Calvinist, as I said before, but I don't go up to heaven on my own free will That's right. in the rapture. Right. That's God's, ta that's God's time to exercise his dominion, his preeminence, his sovereignty when he ruptures me out of this world. We blow out of this world. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's not a new birth, but it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. When you got born again, it's the spiritual experience of coming out of a womb, spiritually speaking. Well, don't you know this earth being the shape that it is, it's like an under a womb. Yeah. And when we blow out of this world, we are coming out of the womb of this world, and we are going up to be with our heavenly uh, Father. And He calls the Jerusalem there our mother, which is above, is the mother of us all. Yeah. This stuff gets fun, man. Yeah. I, I start going up. This gets fun. I'm looking forward to a feast of the marriage. But there's one more. There's one more. Look at Hosea chapter six. Now, you've seen the two days. You've seen the three days. You've seen sort of the typology there. You've seen the Feast of Passover when Christ crucified in the heart of the earth for three days. You see how we are uh, here in this world for 2,000 years as far as the church age goes. When it's over with, we're going to the Feast of Marriage. But there's one more feast after that. Hosea chapter number 6. This has more to do with the Jews. It has everything to do with the Jews, really. The nation of Israel. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. That's a good thing to do anytime. Yeah, yeah, amen. It don't matter what dispensation you're in, it's always good to come to the Lord. Amen. amen. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Now, Doctrinally speaking, the reference here is to the nation of Israel. And the reference there, how God has torn them, and how God has smitten them, uh, what he's talking about there is the persecution that Israel has been under uh, ever since they turned their back on God and they went into captivity. And they haven't been the same since. Now they've gotten back to where God wanted to get to as far as their land, but they're not the people of God the way they're supposed to be the people of God. And that's coming down the road in the future. But it comes after we're caught out of this world. It comes after the marriage feast. Okay. Now watch. Here's that phrase. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Amen. Now you can make that application to the church age by way of saying after two days he's going to revive us. and he has, That could be the rapture for the church. But if you keep, that's the spiritual application. If you keep it in the doctrinal context of the passage, he's talking to the nation of Israel. So after two days, which is the rapture of the church, after two days, we're going to be up in heaven here, God begins dealing with the nation of Israel once more. And for a period of time, whether it be three and a half years, seven and a half years, or ten and a half years, and any one of those things could be proven or disproven, but after that time there, what's called the day of the Lord, all the years are called the day of the Lord. After that time there, 
after the two days is over for the nation of Israel, in the third day, he's going to revive them and restore them back to the people they were. Mm -hmm. That's called the Feast of Tabernacles. That's your third one there. Also called the Feast of Trumpets. You know there, you know why people get confused? They talk about the last trump, 1 uh, Corinthians 15. And they say, well, the church has to go through uh, this period there. They call it the tribulation. The church has to go through it because the last trump. Well, there's a trump for the church, yes. which is his voice. Uh, but then there is a seven trumpet judgment, which is for the nation of Israel, which takes place during this time period, specifically the last three and a half years. But generally speaking, the seven trumpets take place in the time where God judges the nation of Israel. Why? So he can restore them. In fact, if you look at Hosea chapter 6 there, specifically where it talks about he hath torn us and uh, he hath smitten us, specifically that's talking about this time right here. Whether it be three and a half, seven and a half, or ten and a half years, that time period the Lord is going to smite them with the rod of the Antichrist. For that time, he's going to smite them with the battle axe, with the sword. For that time there, the Lord is going to tear apart the nation of Israel to where there's only few remaining. Uh, they're going to be hunted. They're going to be uh, beheaded. They're going to be betrayed. They're going to go through everything that mirrors what Jesus Christ went through while he was yeah. here on earth. Yeah. The same judgment that Christ met at the hand of the Jews, the Jews will meet at the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. But at the end of that thing, it says after two days. And then in the third day. What's the third day? That's the millennial day. Yeah. That third day is that is called the Feast of Tabernacles. It takes place in September. In other words, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ takes place around September time. Not springtime. The rapture of the church, that's closer to being the Passover feast. You with me? That's the marriage feast time, springtime. This Feast of Tabernacles is always in September. The Feast of Trumpets was always in September. So another way you know the church age rapture and the tribulation rapture are different is because they are two different feasts. One is going to be for the church and one's going to be for the nation of Israel. And that thing is called the Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Trumpets. Now here's the blessing thing. When we finish that feast of the marriage, you know what we do? We go on a honeymoon. <laughs> any, of you, any of you ever go on a honeymoon and ride horses? No one's ever done that thing? Crazy, huh? I know. Who wants to be smelling that while you're like, you know, in love with your spouse? You know, you smell the horse and fly. And fly. <laughs> but after we finish with that marriage, you know what we're going to do? Right. We're going to mount on horses, man. Yeah. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of the Lord's host, is going to be in the front of that thing there with Revelation 19, the sword coming out of his mouth, king of kings and lord of lords, and we will be coming back with him on those white horses there, and we are going to come back with him at the battle of Armageddon and to wipe out the Antichrist and all of his minions, and then we go into the millennium, which lasts for a thousand years, then you have the great white throne judgment, then you have eternity. The last feast really is the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a slight pause in it so God can create a new heaven and a new earth. And then the rest of eternity is nothing but one big, giant, eternal feast with the Lord. And so shall they ever be with the Lord. And the Bible says about those things, he says, uh, his government, there shall be no end. Amen. The thing just keeps going and going and going and going out into eternity. Like a, like a circle, it just goes on forever. That's the one that God will use to bring everything all back together. He'll bring all the tribes, all the nations, all the languages, all the tongues, everything together for one feast. Are you still going over to John? We'll close with this. Go over to John. Now, I know that's a lot to take in. You got two days being like two thousand years. You got day of Christ, day of the Lord. You got tribulation. You got antichrist. You got marriage feast, judgment seat of Christ, day of Christ, day of the Lord. There's a lot there. Yeah. Look at uh, look at down at verse number forty six. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman 
whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Galilee, uh, out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Folks, you know where you were before Christ saved you? You were at the point of death. And if it weren't for that sin offering that he was, if it wasn't for that Passover lamb that he was, if it wasn't for after two days, you know where you'd be? You'd be dead and in hell. All of us at one point or another were at the break of death, the point of death. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He was at the point of death, but what happened? Verse 48, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But no one saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. You know how you get saved? You believe the word. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And work effectually in all them that believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says, uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If thou shalt believe in thy heart, the Lord Jesus, and confess in thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. So what am I saying? I'm saying you are at the point of death. And you heard the word of the gospel, the word of his grace. And you believed. And you were born again. You were saved. And then verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. You know what happened after you got saved? You became alive. Amen. You know what that Bible says? Beloved, it, we do, it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. Amen. But you know what it says there? Beloved, now are you the sons of God. Amen. Why? Because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, I became the Son of God. And as a son, an heir of God, a child of God, and as such, I am promised, I am destined to go to a land that never fades away, that never perisheth, Amen. to go have a feast with the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And the last thing that son pictures there is the last thing on our map there. The revival of the nation of Israel. Pictures both you and I and our salvation, but it also pictures the nation of Israel being Reborn and coming back to life. Amen. Amen. It's a lot. Yeah. But you have a part in all of it if you're yeah, saved. Amen. If you're not saved, don't look so good for you. Yeah. Right. If you are saved, thank God you are. Amen. Amen. Don't forget that you are. Amen. And look forward to what God's going to do next. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the day. Lord, I pray you take this in any way you see fit. Apply it to our hearts. Or if nothing else, it just makes us appreciate all that you did at Calvary, all that you went through at Calvary. We can appreciate, we can be thankful, Lord, for uh, all the things perhaps we do not know, but this thing we do know, I know whom I have believed it, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We look forward, God, to your coming. We look forward to the rapture, Lord, that blessed hope. Until then, may we uh, stay by the stuff, continue, Lord, in doing the things that please you. I ask and pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.